Aren't you glad he knows the way through the wilderness? Amen. Amen. 216. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. I'm dwelling in Beulah land. Let's all stand together as we sing on that first together. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth beset on every hand. Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from you. Bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. On that third, let the stormy breezes blow. Their cry cannot alarm me. I am safely sheltered here, protected by the sand. Here the sun is always shining. Here the not can I am safe forever in Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for singing. Good to see you back in church tonight. And uh, had a good service this morning, didn't we? And uh, looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us this evening. Thanks for making it back and being in your place on Sunday night. Let's pray together, shall we? (laughs) Heavenly Father, we bow before you now this evening. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity for us to gather together. And Lord, thank you for each one that's made made, uh, made their way to be back here at church on Sunday night. Lord, thank you for the Uh, wonderful privilege to gather together with your people and sing the songs of God, fellowship with the people of God, and and then get to open up the Word of God. And we ask that the Spirit of God would speak to us tonight. Lord, the best we know how we yield ourselves to you here at the beginning of this service. Make it exactly what you would want it to be and use it in each one of our hearts and lives. Bless every aspect of this service, Lord, for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. Would you turn with me to number 355, 355, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. On that first together, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall the praise begin? Oh, the master's grace of Jesus, deeper than the mind. 
singing. All right. Listen, immediately after the service tonight, uh, the ladies who are going on the ladies retreat uh, coming up in March, uh, you please meet in the conference room just for a brief meeting. And if you're anyone who's still interested in going but has not signed up, you can go to that meeting as well. But uh, that'll be right after the service this evening. All right. Uh, regular schedule this week. Uh, Wednesday night back here for the midweek service and of course Tuesday night for the uh, Grove City School of the Bible as usual uh, Wednesday night midweek service right here Thursday night uh, we're down at the CRC prison Friday night reformers unanimous here at 7 uh, next Saturday at London at 830 for all you inside and of course uh, soul winning and bus visitation at 10 a.m. here on Saturday the next Sunday will be here before we know it and uh, that'll be I Love My Family Sunday, and uh, we'll honor and do some preaching along the family. And you'll also be able to get family portraits taken uh, right after the service, uh, probably Sunday morning and Sunday evening, yes. and uh, both times. So um, you can, uh, Lindy will be set up over in the fellowship hall with a couple different backdrops that you'll be able to uh, get those. And uh, several had them done last year, and they just uh, turned out great. Uh, wonderful job. And so that'll be a great time. Uh, remember, the uh, postcards, I've seen several in the baskets back there. You're bringing those in. I appreciate you doing that. Uh, if you get them in uh, this evening or by Wednesday night, that would be great. And uh, we can get those on their way to the missionaries. All right. Appreciate you helping out with those things. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I have right now. Uh, let's take just a moment and we'll welcome anybody here tonight for the first time. Looking to see if we've got any first timers. I don't think we do. Good to see Kate Harvey back there. Glad she's here. And of course, Sarah Dunn, this is Cindy's daughter, and she was here Wednesday night and uh, still up visiting from Georgia. And uh, great to have her and her family here with us. And uh, glad they're in church tonight. And uh, I think that's uh, all we have. All right, let's hear from the choir this evening.
287 287. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. 287. We'll sing that first, second, and last stanza together. 287. On that first, if you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. He to redeem you died on Calvary. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb. Satan tempts and doubt and fears assail. Look to the Lamb of God. You in his strength shall over all prevail. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb. shadows on your pathway fall. Look to the Lamb of God. Enjoy your sorrow. Christ is all in all. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. For he alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of We, I think we're going to hear another testimony tonight anyway. Uh, they say it's uh, ready to roll, but we're going to hear from John and Carol Coltman tonight on why they love their church. And uh, John and Carol, how long have you been coming? Five years now. And uh, they used to be our neighbors right down the street here and uh, right on Home Road, and that's where we met them. And uh, they came, and uh, just a, a great story. You listen to them sometime about how the Lord brought them uh, to not only to our church, but brought them to himself, and they got saved, and uh, what a blessing they are to our church. These, are these again, are people who do, uh, do a lot of things behind the scenes. They don't uh, need, to need a, the spotlight or to be seen. They just take care of things, and uh, they're always, no matter what the activity is, you can count on them being here early and seeing if they need anybody needs any help or they can help out in any way. Uh, they're here early on Sunday mornings, and they always get the bulletins ready and the Sunday school lessons in the bulletins, and they greet folks at the back door, and they're just, uh, they're just a blessing to our church. And uh, we're sure glad God sent the Coleman's to us, and we love them, and we want to hear why they love their church. All right, Brother Dean? Oh, we got to sing our song, don't we? I always forget that. All right. <laughs> All right, let's hear you sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. All right, now we'll hear from the Colt. Hey, I started Bible Baptist Church in 2010. I got saved over at uh, Pleasant View Baptist. Then I went for a while, I didn't go back to church, I, uh, but I stayed with God. I didn't go backwards or anything, I just didn't join church. Then, Kathy stopped by, I told her Carol was looking for a church. Three days later, the pastor came by. I invited him in the house, was very glad to. And I enjoyed his sermon, he was talking to Carol, him and Bob Wallace. And uh, I like the pastor, I like his preaching, and I enjoy this church. I like this church. And I won't change, I won't say I won't change, but if my mind don't, uh, the Lord's willing, I won't go to another church. I'll continue coming to this one. Because I really like this church. So it's your good. I, I pretty much am the same way. Um, 
uh, when I was married before I went back to John, uh, my husband told me I didn't need to go to a church, even though his mother was real religious. And then when John and I, after I lost him, after I went back with John, uh, like he said, Kathy and, and Cindy stopped by the house, and then the preacher stopped by, and uh, I got saved. I started coming to church, and I got saved and baptized in uh, 2010, 2011, I believe it was. And uh, as far as what we do in the church, I sing in the choir uh, when John's not here. I greet the, the brothers and sisters when they come in to take John's place. And uh, we're always willing to do what we can. And we, we clean when we can, you know, when we're assigned. But we enjoy the church, and we definitely enjoy the, the preaching of the pastor. Yes, yes. That's our Bethlehem Baptist Church. Amen. All right, let's go to 316, if you would, in your hymnal, 316. When you find that, let's stand. Satisfied all my life long, I had panted for a drink from some cool spring. Let's sing that first together. All my life long, I had panted for a drink from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah. I have found him who my soul so long had craved. Jesus satisfies my longing. Through his blood I now am saved. Let's sing that third. Poor I was and sought for riches, something that would satisfy. But the dust I gathered round me only mocks my soul sad cry. Hallelujah, I have found him who my soul so long had craved. Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his blood I now am saved. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. found him who my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through 
his blood I now am saved. On that last together, well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold well that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, I have found him who my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longing. Through his blood I now am saved. Amen. Be seated, if you will. Ushers are coming and ready to get our offering here this evening. Well, uh, I'm going to have Brother Linky pray for the offering, but we want to remember uh, uh, Quentin asked a special prayer. He's having some blood pressure issues, so you pray the Lord will take care of that for him. And uh, we want to remember Dave Paxton has surgery in the morning. Um, Dave's had a growth here on the side that of his neck that has been uh, they've been concerned with quite a while. They're going to remove that tomorrow, uh, but it's pretty delicate surgery, uh, close to some nerves that could, if it, you know, hits it just right, you lose everything in that side of your face, and it'll just kind of collapse on you, so we want to make sure that that, that doesn't happen, and plus it's close to carotid artery as well, and so the, it takes a skillful skillful surgery for for him and then he'll spend the night in the hospital and they'll observe him so i uh, pray for brother dave tomorrow morning and also pray for brother van gelder uh he's going to have his first uh, knee replaced tomorrow morning uh up at riverside so please keep these men in prayer uh, the, uh as they go to surgery tomorrow morning all right brother brother linky you lead us tonight if you would please Lord, we do thank you and praise you for such a beautiful day you've given us. God, I pray you be with those that are in medical need right now, Brother Van Gelder, Brother Quentin, Brother Dave. Lord, I pray that you just give the uh, medical professionals the wisdom that they need to deal with these issues properly. And God, I pray for speedy recovery. We thank you so much for the blessings that you give us so, so richly, so freely, that we almost forget to thank you for them. And God, we do want to just give back just a little bit what you've given us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. That was good. That was enjoyable. Um, it, are you both singing? Because you don't. You're gonna have to use this microphone. The other one's on red. I don't know where Bob is. Bob's out. We got to replace the microphone. It's not gonna. If Cindy's gonna use that handheld mic, she needs a battery in it. Okay. I hope that one's good. Because you need one there and one here, right? Okay. I thought so. So what's that, Bob? 
No, it's on the organ. Bob, you got it? Got a battery? I don't know about that one. I know this one's on red. Okay, change that one. I just don't want to wait them to get up and not, not have it ready to go. So you do that, all right, while we read the scripture. Take your Bible this evening and turn to Acts chapter 4, if you would please, for our scripture reading, Acts chapter 4. There's three verses we'll read tonight, verse 31, 32, and 33. Well, let's read 31 together. I'll read 32, and we'll end together on verse number 33. All right. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing to read God's Word. Let's begin together on verse number 31. Ready? And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And let's pray. Father, we do ask you to add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the good music this evening. My, it's wonderful to hear the people of God sing. And Lord, I'm thankful uh, for the wonderful songs of God you've given to us. And uh, Lord, we're asking now that you would prepare our hearts, make us ready to receive the truth from your word this evening. Lord, I pray you'd help us to uh, rid our minds of things that would capture our thoughts and keep us from being attentive uh, to the message from your word this evening. Pray you'd bless the special as the ladies sing now. Use it to minister to our hearts and to put us in tune with thee for your word. It's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. <laughs> Well, it's been a some time since I made up my mind to make Jesus Lord of my life. I faced some tears and I shed many tears till Jesus stood by my side. When I hear Satan say that you're not even saved and you're traveling down the wrong track, I recall once again where forgiveness may now memory lane, I'll take him back. I take him back to a time at an old-fashioned meeting when the presence of God filled the air. When the saints were singing of grace and glory, sweet melody seasoned with prayer. When one simple sermon from an old-fashioned preacher was like pipe to a poor dying slave. I walked him down the aisle to a place at the altar where grace fell, and I know I got saved. I never knew love till it came from above, and it took its abode in my heart. The sun now shines brighter, my burden is lighter, since Jesus gave me a new start. Now I've been changed, my whole life's rearranged, my journey is now a new road. And when that old accuser tells me I'm a loser, I remind him how he lost my soul. I take him back to a time at an old-fashioned meeting when the presence of God filled the air. When the saints were singing of grace and glory, sweet melody seasoned with prayer. When one simple sermon from an old-fashioned preacher was like life to a poor dying slave. I walk him down the aisle to a place at the altar where grace fell and I know I got saved. I'm saved to the uttermost and I know that I am washed in the blood of the precious lamb through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost I'm saved to the uttermost I'm saved I'm saved
Amen. That's good. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies. Wonderful. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this evening. Thank you, Father, for the, again, for the truth of that song. Thank you, Lord, for the old-fashioned church. Father, I pray that you'll help us now as we go to your word this evening and we bring the message for tonight and we focus again on the church and especially church the way it ought to be. Pray your blessing on the message and Lord, help me as I bring the message and please help each individual as they listen tonight. Lord, I pray you would uh, firmly ground us in the truth that we'll bring this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Um, we're familiar, most of us, with McDonald's. How many are familiar with Burger King? The slogan of Burger King for years, I don't know if it still is or not, it used to be, have it your way. I used to remember, you know, hold the pickle, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. Remember that one? All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. Because at Burger King, see at McDonald's you said, I don't want pickle or I don't want lettuce or I don't want this. That was a problem. So Burger King got the idea, hey, have it your way. You want, don't want pickle on that? That's fine with us. We'll just, we just want to serve it your way. They were number two, and they were trying to be number one. And they just wanted to have it your way. And uh, the difficulty is, we've uh, got a generation of Christians that they want church that way. Uh, they want the Burger King church. They want to have church their way. Uh, George Barna, who is a Christian researcher and author, he said that he revealed a trend among Christians. He said he expects to see Christians in the immediate future, here's his quote, choosing from a proliferation of options, weaving together a set of favored alternatives into a unique tapestry that cons constitutes the personal church of the individual. How do you like that? The personal church of the individual. It's the Burger King church. He sees that Christians in this coming generation are going to seek a unique, highly personalized church experience. The problem is, Barna doesn't just report on these things. He's an author. And he has an agenda. He wants to... Um, he has a book called Revolution. And he's advocating what he just wrote about as the best way for Christians to live their Christian life. He writes, my goal is to help you become a revolutionary. Advocating Christians to leave the traditional church behind. And I'll say it, I've said it from the pulpit before and I'll say it again, that if you leave church you will drift away and eventually leave the Lord. If you leave church, you will drift away and leave the Lord. And all, you know, and, and Brother John, I know what you said earlier about, you know, left church, you didn't leave God. But you know what? You're not, you're not now where you were then. You're, you're different now than what you'd have been if you hadn't been in church the last four years. I'll guarantee it. Uh, there's no way to, to change that. And uh, when you start to drift from church, you begin to drift Lord. Now, we're going to come back to Acts chapter 4, but I want to show you something from Hebrews chapter 10. Would you turn over there, please? Take your Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter 10. This illustrates what I'm talking about, uh, the point about when you begin to drift from church, you're going to drift from the Lord. And it's very clear in Hebrews 10 here, he's dealing uh, with apostasy. And in the context, you have to understand the context of the verse. We quote verse 25, which says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And then a lot of times we just pull that verse out and we preach on that verse, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. There's a great truth in it. But it's also always right and always good to look at the context in which that verse sits. And the context here of this verse is the apostasy, falling away from the faith. And, and don't miss the connection because right after 25 comes 26. Isn't that deep? And uh, 26, notice right after it says, so much more as you see they approaching, for 
If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He's talking that 25 is a warning that you won't get to verses 26 and 27. But if you ignore verse 25 and you forsake the assembly of yourselves together, you, you will de- absolutely uh, fall from the faith. And, and by the way, undergo the judgment of God. Uh, God chastens those whom He loves. And if you truly are a child of God and you get away from Him, the Bible says that every, listen, He chastens every son whom He receiveth. And if He's received you, He'll take you to the woodshed. And so you have to understand that, 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 it's the, that you cannot substitute the local church. Sometimes I hear people say, well, I, I, I don't give up meeting with other Christians. I mean, I go to a Bible study at Starbucks and, and I uh, meet with people over meals or I go to my neighbor's house and we have a Bible study or uh, we, we get together with my home school group and we have church and, and, and people come, all, all kinds of things that they say uh, takes the place of them going to church. Now, is anything wrong just in themselves? Is it wrong to have a Bible, with some, Bible study with somebody at a restaurant? Of course not. Is it wrong to have a Bible study with somebody at a home? Of course not. Uh, say, what's wrong with it when you call it church? Then there's a problem. Because that's not church. That's fellowship. That's Bible study. That's, that may be a prayer meeting, but it's not church. And, and you can, the Bible would encourage us to have fellowship with other believers. And that's a good thing, and that's a right thing, but it doesn't take the place of a local church. Uh, the kind of thing, listen, nothing will substitute you being an active part of a New Testament local Baptist church. The Bible talks about how, you remember in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how we're members one of another. Okay? And, and likened it to the body, remember? He said the, the eye can't say to the ear, the the you know the the nose can't say to the hand and things like that. I have no need of you. Uh, try. Let me ask you a question. If I if you cut that arm off, how well is that arm going to work when it's not a part of the body? Hmm. There's no hope. Right. It's important that stays attached to the body for it to function like it ought to function. How well do you think you're going to function as a believer if you cut yourself off from the body? You don't function very well. You don't function the way God intended for you to function. Nothing else can take its place. So, what are the listen? What 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 is it that we we don't come together to have church our way? We come together to have church God's way. What's His way? Well, you know, for us, God has given us that in the Bible. What what is it to have church? What we say the way it ought to be. And, and, and the ways when we can say it's church the way it ought to be is because we have a blueprint, like we spoke this morning, of what a church ought to be. God didn't leave us clueless. God didn't leave us without any kind of a pattern with which to look at. And the pattern is in the book of Acts. Let's go back there again, if you would, to Acts chapter 4, where we read the Scripture this evening. Acts chapter 4. Church the way it ought to be. The first thing I notice, if you notice in Acts chapter 4, let's, let's look at uh, the, the first characteristic of the way church it ought to be, and they alluded to it in the song they sang tonight. And that is number one, it is endued with power. It is endued with power. That's the characteristic, the first characteristic of a church the way it ought to be. You ought to see the power of God present. By the way, not just in the pastor, though the pastor is included, but also in the people. You say, oh, fill the pastor with your power. And I appreciate you praying for that. And I pray for that. And I want God to fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. But listen, I I, I pray for you to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just Spirit-filled preachers, but Spirit-filled listeners as well. Look at verse 8 in Acts 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. And then he goes on to talk about uh, being judged for the man that was made whole. But notice Peter's the leader. He's the pastor, if you will, uh, preaching here, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. But go down to verse number 31. And when they had prayed, now everybody's praying, and the church prays together, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all, what church? Filled with the Holy Ghost. 
And they spake the word of God with boldness. Hey, that's the kind of filling of the Holy Spirit I'd like to see. That's when church is what it ought to be. When we're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, we don't all speak in languages. Nobody knows what we're saying. We speak the Word of God with boldness. That's the kind of Spirit-filledness we need in our day and age. Uh, it's not some ecstatic experience. We need to be able to speak the Word of God with boldness. And so we need God's power. And, in, and listen, we don't have the power of God in the churches today. We have, we're, we've arrived at the point where we have the form of godliness but deny the power thereof, and so we have to manufacture it. How do you manufacture it? You get a praise band. How do you manufacture it? You get praise singers. You get a praise team. You get the music. You get the lights that somebody talked about this morning, Brother Messer. You know, you get the strobe lights going on. And you, you, you look, really, you, you put a picture, uh, some of you won't know this, some of you with, that are you know, a certain age will know this, but you get a picture of the disco from the 1970s and some of the church services in 2000s, and you can't tell the difference. The lighting, the music, everything's the same. It's all designed to get everybody revved up years ago. Oh, I'm going back 30 years ago. Had a fellow who was trying to decide, he'd come to our church and enjoyed the preaching, and enjoyed the service, but his wife and uh, like the charismatic church that they were going to go to, and he said, I, I just, he said, and I kind of like it too. He said, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's like a pep rally. He said, man, it just gets my juices going. See, and he wanted the music jacked him up, man. He was just excited, and he was getting all, all fired up. Hey, it doesn't matter. The, you can have the drums and the lights and the music and get all wavy and get all excited, but listen, that isn't a substitute for the power of God. You can't substitute that. And we're trying to do everything because we're trying to cover for the fact the power of God's not there. Paul said over in... 1 Corinthians chapter 2 to the church at Corinth. Let me read it for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5. Here's what Paul said to that church. And I'll get it here. He said, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul said, listen, I wasn't there to impress you with my speech. I wasn't there to impress you with my knowledge or my learning. I wasn't there for everybody to walk out and say, man, how smart our pastor is or how intelligent he is or how well he knows Greek or Hebrew. He said, I want you to walk out and say, man, the power of God was present in that service. That's what's missing. Church the way it ought to be had the power of God. It was a dead church and nobody really cared except for one man. He was a blacksmith. He wasn't much of a talker. He, in fact, he stuttered so bad when he spoke that it was painful to listen to him. But he had a heart for God. And he went home from church and he began to pray for God to send a revival to his church. In fact, he got so burdened for God to send the power of God upon his church, he closed his shop and went home and continued praying throughout the day. That evening, he went to the pastor and he said, Pastor, I've been praying for revival, praying for the, the fire of God to fall upon our church. And he said, can we have a revival? Can we schedule some kind of meeting, some kind of revival around here? And the pastor grudgingly agreed, but he said, he added with this warning, you can schedule it, but nobody's coming. Well, they had a meeting. And to the pastor's surprise, when he walked in the building, it was full. And he stood up to preach and he, he knew something was different. The power of God was present in the building. God moved in a, in a very definite way. And that evening, dozens of people came to know Christ as their Savior in the service. And revival began to happen in that church. What was that? Hey, it wasn't methods. It wasn't organization. It wasn't even promotion. It was somebody praying for the power of God to fall. Somebody praying to be endued with power from on high. Listen to me. Somebody prayed. We need to get the church back to being the praying church again. That's how you get the power of God. You don't get it unless you ask for it. You don't get it unless you beg for it. 
It's listed in Luke 11, and it's after the, the fellow who, who came and begged for the bread for his, his visitor that came to him in his journey. And remember, he didn't get it because he was his friend. He got it because of his importunity, his, his constant begging for it. He wasn't going to take no for an answer. Our problem, I fear, in our churches, listen, is we've settled for not having the power of God. And we're happy and content to have less than what God intended for us to have. When God works in a church and decisions are made for Christ and, and, and uh, marriages are saved and lives are changed and uh, people are added to the church, I'm going to tell you something. You bank on it. Somebody's praying. Somebody's paying the price in prayer. Those things don't come without prayer. One day on vacation, D.L. Moody visited a large but dead church in London. The pastor had asked him to come over and preach all the services that day. And he didn't really want to, but he went anyway, and he said he preached in the morning, and he said the people were so unresponsive, he said it was all I could do to get through the service. He said, then it occurred to me, I've got to go back at night and preach the evening service. And he said, I dreaded it literally all afternoon. But behind the scenes, something was going on. An elderly woman went home that day and she told her invalid sister whom she lived with that D.L. Moody had been at the church that morning. And her sister's eyes lit up. She'd been praying for months that God would send D.L. Moody to England. To London specifically. She told her sister, put the lunch away. We're going to spend the rest of the afternoon in prayer and fasting for the service this evening. And they did. Moody said he stood up that night before the people and he could tell something was different. He said there was an electricity in the building, an electricity in the air that he could not describe, but he could feel. He preached with great liberty. He said, when I gave the invitation for those who would be saved and receive Christ as their Savior, he said 500 people stood up. He said, I told them all to sit down. I thought they didn't understand what I said. And I repeated it again. And the 500 people stood up again. It was the beginning of what became a great revival that swept over England. Why? Because of two ladies. One of them an invalid. Nearly bedridden. Who said, we don't need more organization. We don't need more activities. We need the power of God. We need the power of God again. And they paid the price in prayer. Boy, they paid the price in prayer here in Jerusalem. You say, boy, what a great time to have 3,000 people saved. But they prayed for 10 days. We pray for 10 minutes and we wonder why we don't see people getting saved. You want the church service to be exciting again? You want it to be inspiring again? You want to be tuned in again? Just ask, answer me this question. How much time do you spend praying for the service? You want more missionaries to be supported? Do you pray for the missionaries we have? Do you pray for God to send forth laborers? Pray for divine wisdom for the leadership of the church? You know what happens when you try to keep going for God, but you don't pray? You don't ask for God's power? And yet you keep trying to do everything that you want to do to, that you think has to happen in order to, to minister to people and get people in? You know what, that, you know what happens? They call it burnout listen carefully burnout is simply you trying to do for God in your power what God intended for you to do in his power God intended you to serve him in his power not your power serving God without the power of God is a chore it becomes a burden becomes difficult. I don't want to serve God that way. 
I want to serve God in the energy of the Holy Spirit of God. I want to serve God with His power, not the energy of the flesh. It's not, listen, church isn't about us trying to create an atmosphere or trying to make something happen. That's not church the way it ought to be. Church is where we, we say, God, I want something to happen to me, in me, and through me as I come to church today. Asking God to do something in us and through us, maybe even despite us, but to do something in our midst. That's the way it ought to be. Endued with power. Secondly, uh, if church is the way it ought to be, I want you to notice this church, again, Acts chapter 4, they were equal in their positions. They were equal in their positions in the church. Verse 24 of Acts 4, it says, When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and they pray. But notice, they all prayed and they all were with one accord. Verse number 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Oh, they, 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 they were all pulling in the same direction. They all locked arms together and said, we're in this together. No, no social status, no, 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 no big shots, no little shots. They were all together. The ground is level when you walk through the doors of the church. Doesn't matter who you are out there, and if you're a CEO of a company or if you're a janitor who sweeps the floor, it doesn't matter. When you come in here, you're a brother or a sister in Christ. It's all level when you come to the church. No looking at each other, no comparing one with another. Now there's three dangers that happen when, with people in a church, with members in a church. There's three dangers that you can fall into. Number one is to magnify your importance. You can magnify your importance. In other words, you feel so indispensable that you better get special treatment or you'll just show that church and you'll leave it. Okay? So you want privilege or you want special consideration or you want special recognition. Let me tell you something. It can happen to any church member. God's work is bigger than any member of the church. But i got news for you. It can also happen to the pastor. The pastor can get to thinking he's bigger than, than, than anything. And boy, that, that church doesn't have me. Boy, let's see what happens if they don't have me. Yeah, they, God may really bless it. Don't get to thinking. You, you, can, you know, the pastor can magnify his own importance too much too. And let's, uh, don't, don't fall into that trap. Uh, it's not, you know... It, <laughs> If it's pride when the church member does it, it's pride when the pastor does it too. Hey, if God, God moved me out of the way, or if he, he had me uh, go somewhere else, or if I dropped dead tonight of a heart attack or something, listen, then, then you get some men together and you pray about it, and you ask who God wants to come in to take my place, and you know what? The work goes on. Bigger than I am. Uh, Bible battle is going on before I got here. It'll go on after I'm gone, if the Lord tarries. I'm not magnifying my importance, and don't you do it either. Okay? Now, there's the other, other extreme. You can minimize your importance. Don't go to that extreme either. Because that will lead to unfaithfulness. Well, it doesn't matter if I'm in the choir or not. There's 20 people up there. Well, it doesn't matter if I'm there to teach or not. It doesn't matter if I take my turn in the nursery or not. It's okay. they got other people who will serve. It doesn't matter if I miss my tithe. Other people are tithing. You see, and all of a sudden we minimize our importance. But the Bible, listen, one of the greatest abilities is dependability. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. There's no little, little jobs of importance. Hey, you know, we talked about the body and being members of the body. What, what, what member of your body would you be willing to give up? In fact, when a certain member of the body, you know, and as, as you grow older... I'm discovering there's always something that doesn't work quite right. And it's aggravating. It's frustrating. Okay? And, and, and I don't like it. And, and listen, it's the same way when a member of the body of Christ isn't operating right, isn't faithfully working, isn't faithfully in their place. 
Don't underestimate. Don't minimize your importance. Don't magnify your importance. But listen, don't misplace your importance. Say, so how do you misplace your importance? Trying to be something that God never intended for you to be. Okay? Somebody says, well, hey, listen, I can, I can say, you know what? Brother Danny, come on up here and play us a nice special on the piano. It wouldn't take, you say, how do you know if you're gifted to play the piano or not? If people want to listen to you play the piano. <laughs> if they don't want to listen to you play the piano. How do I know if I'm gifted to sing a solo or not? Do people want to listen to you sing a solo? And, and let, me, let me help you. If, if you're singing a solo, and people are sitting, and you start singing, and, and they go, You may be misplacing your gift. It may not be, that may not be what, what you, you, you have a misplacing your importance. When I have a, if you have the gift of teaching or singing or playing an instrument, you'll know you have that gift because people have the gift of wanting to listen to you. Amen. It's okay. Hey, like I say, that you, you you find what the gift is that God's given to you and you use it. And, 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 and we're all equal. Nobody, is, nobody has a better gift or a bigger gift. Listen, your, your, your nose, your ears, your eyes, your hands, you know what? Everybody gets to see those. They get the spotlight. Well, what's wrong with the big toe? Hmm? Big toe, always get covered up. Unless you're wearing sandals in February. Huh? How would you like to have a toe right here? Huh? Yeah, it look a little weird, huh? It's not the job of the toe. The toe, hey, so you're willing to give up your big toe because it, it's got to be hidden and under your sock and your shoe? No, I understand without a big toe, you can't even stand up. You have no balance. I think it's pretty important. But it's important because it's willing to stay hidden and do its job behind the scenes. There are many things inside your body that do a job that could get very jealous because they're not ever seen. That you wouldn't want to stop working or you wouldn't want them to trade places just so they could be seen. Thank God they faithfully do their work even though nobody ever sees them. And thank God for church members who know their gift, exercise their gift, serve God, even though they never get in the spotlight. God sees everything you do. Don't forget that. So they were endued with power. They were equal in position. But I see something else here. They were evangelistic in their priorities evangelistic in their priorities. They begin everywhere at the end of chapter 2 that we read this morning. The Bible talks about how they continued daily with one accord in the temple and from breaking bread from house to house. And they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I believe daily they... Cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And by the way, the best, the best outreach you have is, listen, I, I, I think you ought to have a time. I think soul winning is important enough. You ought to have a time set in your week when that's what you do. Is all you do is you're going out with the express purpose of trying to lead someone to Christ, trying to give the gospel to someone and see if you can lead them to, to receive Christ their Savior. You have a hard time if you were called, listen, if you were called to the witness stand and put on the witness stand and they were convicting you of being a witness for Christ, how would you fare? When they ask how much time do you spend trying to witness to others in a week? Well, how many gospel tracts do you give to people during the week? Well, when's the last time you tried to give the plan of salvation to somebody? What if you have to answer those questions under oath? 
The old old fashioned church was evangelistic in its priority. Evangelism, soul winning. That's what the old fashioned church was about. Vance Havner said, Evangelism is to Christianity what veins are to our bodies. You should be able to cut a true Christian anywhere and they'll bleed evangelism. They'll bleed the gospel. Sometimes churches say we major on evangelism or we major on soul winning. Well, that's like a doctor saying I major on healing people. That's, I kind of expect that. Why would we even have to major or say that we major on that? Because the church has gotten away from what it ought to be. It ought to be a soul-saving station. It's all right. It's not primarily just to get people saved. But listen, there ought to be a, there ought to be a place where people can come and hear the gospel and receive Christ as their Savior. The folks who come in the doors, on, especially on big days and such, listen, they're just coming for a free dinner or coming for uh, some special day we have. But you know what happens? God speaks to their heart. And they realize for the first time they're a sinner who needs a Savior and that Jesus will save them if they'll come and receive Him. And they come and receive Christ. The church is to be a hospital for sinners, not a rest home for the saints. R.G. Lee, the longtime pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church in Tennessee, said, God never intended for the church to be a refrigerator in which to preserve the perishable piety. He was a master wordsmith. He intended it to be an incubator in which to hatch our converts. I like that. Fishers of men, not keepers of the aquarium. Okay? Keep the track rack filled. That's why we keep the track rack filled. That's why, that's why we have a radio program. That's why there is an RU ministry. That's why we, we spend the money to go to the prisons and, and minister to the, to the inmates there. And that's why we have a bus ministry. And that's why we spend money on big days and country fairs and dinner days. And that's why we try to reach the community. And that's why we get into the parade. And listen, why? Souls trying to get the gospel to people, trying to let folks know that there is hope and there is an answer. They need Jesus Christ. Church the way it ought to be, endued with power, equal in position, evangelistic in priority. And then number four, it exalts the preaching of the Word of God. We mentioned this morning all the preaching that went on in the early church. What did Paul write Timothy as preacher boy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2? He said, Timothy, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Why? Because Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. We're, we're, we've come to that time. The old time church had biblical teaching and preaching. The church the way it ought to be will tell you what the Bible says, not just what you want to hear. We are not here to agree with the world. We are here to agree with God. I'm not interested in lowering the, lowering the standard down to the people. I'm interested in bringing the people up to the standard. That's what God wants. That's the old fashioned church. We're going to preach Christ crucified, buried, and risen again. And by the way, and coming again. I still want to preach that, listen, hell is real. Hell is, hell is fire. Hell is torment. Hell is, is eternal separation from God where, where anyone who rejects Christ their Savior will go when they die. Heaven is real. Holy living before God is right. Faithfulness to church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Three to thrive in your Christian life. I'm preaching that we're saved by grace through faith. You're not saved, and by the way, you're saved to serve. You're not saved to sit and to soak and to sour. You're saved to serve. Churches, churches, when church is the way it ought to be, you learn the great doctrines of the Bible. You learn the Word of God. And you get the Bible taught the way it should be. And I want to show you something. By the way, that's why... God gave the church pastors. Pastors, as you, you know, they're, they're, they're the pastor 
and the teacher of the Word of God. And pastors are to be apt to teach. It means I believe one of the gifts that God has to give a pastor is the ability to teach the Bible. And if that's not your gift, then God probably hasn't called you to pastor. And, and you have to have that gift. Let me help you understand that, okay? Here's something that I thought would be a blessing to you that I mentioned this morning that I learned this week that I think it'll be a great help to you. I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 15. Would you turn there, please? Genesis chapter 15. Are you doing okay? This is the last point, but it's, it'll take a couple places to go. We're going to go to Genesis. We're going to go over to Acts. But then we'll wrap it up. <coughs> Genesis 15. Notice verse 5 with me, will you please? And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. This is God having conversation with Abraham. Okay? And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst. He cut them up, and he laid each piece one against another, but the birds he divided not, divided he not. And when the fowls came upon, down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away, drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go out to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. And he talks about when they'll come out. In the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now watch. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. This is the Abrahamic covenant. Now I want you to understand, what is going on here? Let me help you understand this, okay? Abraham, is, God has made some statements, and Abraham questions God about those promises. And God says, here's what I want you to do. Gather together these animals that he mentioned uh, in the verse there. And the heifer, the she-goat, and the ram, and then the turtle dove and the pigeons. And he says, I want you to gather those animals. And, he, and Abraham cuts those animals up in pieces. And then he falls asleep. And when he goes to sleep, he sees a, a furnace and a burning lamp. A torch, if you will. And it moves between these pieces that he's laid on the altars. And, and, and you think, well, what's that got to do with anything? Here's what it has to do with. It's the Abrahamic covenant. And God is now promising to bless Abraham and the Jewish descendants. Abraham as a Jew. But Abraham came out, was born in Ur of the Chaldeans. According to Chaldean custom, a covenant was affirmed and validated by the death of one or more animals, depending on the importance of the covenant. And so two men making a bilateral covenant, once they took the animals and, and divided them up and said, but the two men would walk between those cut up sacrifices. And what they were saying was, May this happen to me if I don't fulfill my part of our covenant. Now understand, when Abram asked God, remember, Abram asked God in verse 8, he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? 
How do I know you're going to keep your word? How do I know that this is going to be true and it's going to come to pass? And that's when God tells them to take those animals and we're going to make a covenant. Okay? But notice, when God cut the animals up, He caused a deep sleep to fall on Abraham. Did Abraham and God walk through those? No. God walked through it by Himself. He's saying this, this covenant, Abraham, is not a bilateral covenant. You keeping your end of the deal and me keeping my end of the deal, it is all on me. I'm walking through it and this covenant is not about who you are or what you do. This covenant is about who I am and what I do. It's all upon me. It's a unilateral covenant depending upon God alone and, and not having anything to do with what Abraham did do or didn't do. God's plans and His promises are perfect because they depend upon Him and His perfection. That's the grace of God. Now, keep that in mind and let's look at the New Testament. Go to the book of Acts, will you please? Go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, you're familiar with this. This is the Paul and Silas in jail in Philippi where they're singing the praises to God at midnight, you know, and the earthquake comes. But nobody escapes, they all stay. The jailer springs in. And he brought them out in verse 30 and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now when you look at that, you think, well, that's a pretty, pretty simple verse. Doesn't, doesn't appear to be a whole lot there. Now, I want, you to, I want to explain, I want to dissect it a little bit for you, okay? The word, when it says in verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The word believe, you know, means to have faith in, or faith upon, or respect to a person or a thing. It simply means that I'm entrusting my spiritual well-being to Jesus Christ. I'm putting my trust in Jesus Christ. Now, the word saved means to be preserved, protected, or delivered. It refers to a person's eternal salvation. Now, what we, what we don't have, you know, the, most of the time with, with English in our English reading, we have past tense, present tense, and future tense. Now, I know there's a past perfect and some other things in there, but, but basically we have those three basic tenses. And, and, in the, and in the language that God wrote the Bible in, and when He gave the New Testament, He gave it in the Greek language as a very expressive language. For instance, you've heard us talk about ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened. And we talk about, is that just ask one time? No, it's a, it's a continual sense. It's a ask and ask and ask and keep on asking. Seek and seek and seek and keep on seeking. We don't have any verb tense in the English language that, that says that. Okay, And so there's, there's, there's some limitations here. I want you to understand the tense that is used here uh, in, in for the word believe, the verb believe in verse number 31, it means to believe at a single point in time. To believe at a single point in time. And, and the tense, but when you go to the tense of the word saved, what tense that it's used in, it means it's an ongoing process, time without end. Okay? So listen. So if I expand and dissect that verse, here's what it is. Believe at one single point of time in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will continually be saved for all time. As well as your household if they believe. It's exactly what he's teaching. And again, because it doesn't rely upon, it relies on my one time believing. He does the continuing. Because the covenant is not both of us walking through the sacrifice, it's God walking through the sacrifice. It's unilateral. So it teaches that three, three things that verse teaches. We're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. The only one you can believe in is in Jesus Christ. The second is that, that salvation is not an ongoing thing that we have to keep believing. That believing is a one-time Okay? It's a one-time belief. 
and then God gives you eternal salvation. Spiritual growth is an ongoing process, but your salvation isn't. The Bible says when you believe in Christ, you're past. Past tense. Past from death unto life. It's a, it's a, it's a done transaction. And the third doctrine, of course, is eternal security. It's, in fact, it's, it's very plain then that once you are saved, once you believe, you are eternally saved. Because it isn't, it isn't on you. It's on God. And we're kept by His power. Now, listen. Aren't you glad you came to church? If, if that's all I said, got up and just said that, you'd have said, hey, you know what? That was worth coming to church for tonight. Okay? That's the benefit. Hey, I don't think the guy having a Bible study at Starbucks, you're going to learn that. Okay? But, but when, you, when you put yourself in with, a, with a pastor and a teacher, you can be taught the Word of God. You can be taught the Bible. I, I was, you know, I thank God that, that I was brought up in a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Thank God for the men I was brought up under and the... the the, the opportunity to, to learn the Bible. I was, I was way ahead of the curve when I went to Bible college. I already knew a lot of the Bible. And, and, and because of the, the, the upbringing that I was honored to have and privileged to have with, with my family. And so I think that's church the way it ought to be. Endued with power from on high, equal in position, evangelistic in priority, and exalting the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. And that's, hey... By God's grace, that's the way it's been at Bible Baptist for 60 years. By God's grace, it'll continue that way until Jesus comes again. And I believe, listen, I believe there's people out there that still are looking for church the way it ought to be. And we just have to continue to be faithful. And, and let's, let's keep taking the message out. Let's get folks saved and continue to reach out to people to say, hey, there are still churches that, that are singing the hymns of God and singing the songs of God and, and still honoring the preaching of the Word of God. And, and there are folks who still want that. Still people who want church the way it ought to be. All right, let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the, your Word. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful promises of the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a blueprint allowing and writing down, the, having Luke uh, to record for us this New Testament church of Jerusalem. It's been, a, it's been a help to us today. It's been an encouragement to us today. Thank you for those who've gone before us at Bible Baptist Church and has been faithful to teach and preach your word and to, to hold the line and the, the message of the church and the music of the church and the methods of the church. Lord, we want to continue that. The baton has been handed to us for such a time as this. And help us to be faithful, to continue to have church the way it ought to be. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I know that normally on a Sunday night crowd, and I think I, I know everyone here, but I want to make sure that if you died tonight, that you're 100% sure you'd go to heaven. Don't listen. Don't worry about what people think. You be concerned about what you and God know. And if you've never received Christ as your Savior, I would beg you not to put it off. Say, oh, what will people think of me? You know what they'll think? Hallelujah. I'm glad they're saved. I'm glad they settled it. That's just the devil talking to you, saying that, oh, people will think I'm bad. No, they'll praise the Lord for that. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, and you're really struggling with it, and you're honest enough to admit it, would you let me pray for you? Would you slip your hand up right now and just say, Pastor, pray for me this evening? I'm not sure about that. I'm struggling. The message was to believers and really was to our church. I guess just more of an encouragement that we continue to be church as it ought to be. And I realize you, you want that here. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here on a Sunday night. But you understand 
you being here on Sunday night is a stamp of approval that you want church the way it ought to be. You being here on Wednesday nights, your stamp of approval saying you want church the way it ought to be. I wonder if tonight, maybe the Lord spoke to your heart. I don't know at what point it is. Maybe it's serving with His power and not your own power. Maybe it's maximizing. Maybe it's, maybe it's magnifying your position. Maybe it's minimizing your position. Maybe it's misplacing your position. Maybe it's not being very evangelistic, not, not, not being soul conscious like you should be, getting the gospel to other people. I'm not sure what it is that the Lord spoke to your heart about, but He spoke to your heart tonight, and you say, Preacher, the Spirit of God has spoken to me. Would you pray for me this evening? Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Yes. Amen. You may put them down. I'll pray in a moment. We'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to Him this evening. Whatever it is that God's dealing with your heart about, just, just say yes and obey Him. Heavenly Father, have your way now in this invitation. Thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Lord, I pray you'll hear our prayer tonight on bended knee. If, if no other reason, Lord, we ought to bow before thee tonight and say, Lord, keep our church what she ought to be that we would have your blessing and your power upon our lives. That you would use us to be a lighthouse, not only here in Grove City and in Columbus, but in Ohio and in America and around the world through the reach of the missionaries and those we send with the gospel. So, Father, thank you for speaking to us. And now, hear our prayer as we bow the knee to you. Quietly with your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Look this way just a minute, if you would, please. And um, go ahead and be seated for a second. 
Um, appreciate your attention this evening. Been a good day today. Uh, coming up this fall, the Linkies will be adding to our church. Uh, they're going to add a third one to their family, those of you who didn't know that. And uh, they have found out, of course, they have two boys, Josh and Sammy, Joshua and Samuel. And uh, they're going to reveal, they wanted to reveal to our church first the gender of their third one. Boy or girl? How many, let's take a vote. How many think it's a boy? How many think it's a boy? Oh, put them up, put them up. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, 13, 14, okay. All right, about 15 of us. How many think it's a girl? Wow. Overwhelming. I think it's a girl. Okay, they're going to reveal. what I don't know what they have planned. I don't know how they're going to do it, but uh, here they come. You got something here, and Lindy's got a camera? Another boy, and, and do you have a name picked out for him? You're still guess, you're working on that. All right, all right. Na 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 na. If you're under forty, you don't even know what that is, probably. But oh, congratulations! That's great. Another boy. Well, you're three fifths of the way to your basketball team. Uh, One of the, I can't remember what preacher it was, Dr. Rice had seven daughters. There was another preacher that had, I think, all, I think all boys, five or seven boys. And they used to tease each other that they would teach the other one how to have a girl or he'd teach them how to have a boy, you know. But, you know, you take who the Lord gives you, amen? And uh, that's exciting. That's great. When's the, when's the due date? July 28th. July 28th, okay. All right. And, uh, yes, it is. It is. I thought it was later than that, but it's coming, coming soon. All right. Congratulations. And uh, he has some cupcakes over in the fellowship hall. Whoa. They went. They went big time. They got Oreos. First class. Top of the line. All right. Great. Marvelous. Yeah. Bob, Bob will lead you in the closing hymn. I have something I need to do. And, uh, no. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's great. No, we won't do that. That's great. All right. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank you for a wonderful day today. And Father, thank you. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, we enjoy the people of God in this place. And what we do pray for Brett and Lisa is they go through expecting this next one that you've blessed them with. The fruit of the womb is your reward. And Lord, I pray that you'll help every mom and baby both to be healthy and give them a, a good delivery, Lord. And we thank you for their service for you here. Now, Father, bless the fellowship together. And Lord, give us a good week this week. Help us to, Lord, make us mindful that you go with us as we leave this place tonight. May others see Christ in us this week. Help us to be busy about your business. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. All right, let's sing that together. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. God bless you. You're dismissed. Ladies, remember your meeting.